Today, we're going to talk about the UAP congressional hearings. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, quite simply, this is what you said. This is hearings from Congress, and the people asking the questions are, I believe, members of the House, I believe. Um, but the people answering to our fighter pilots, both retired, and the middle guy is Mr. Grush, we've covered before, who is an intelligence officer who was involved in the program. And that's about as much as you need to know to start. Based off of each of your experiences and observations, do you believe UAPs pose a potential threat to our national security? I'll do it. Yes, and here's why. The, the technology that we faced was far superior than anything that we had, and you could put that anywhere. If you, if you had one, you captured one, you reverse engineered it, you got it to work, you're talking something that can go into space, go someplace, drop down in a matter of seconds, do whatever it wants, and leave, and there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing. Okay. Either the other, you two. Well, I would also like to add from a commercial aviation and military aviation perspective, we deal with uncertainty in our operating space as a matter of, uh, of our protection, professional actions. Identifying friend from foe is, is very important to us. Uh, and so when we have unidentified targets and we continue to ignore those due to a stigma or a fear of what it could be, that's an opening that our adversaries can take advantage of. What, what, what uh, steps should be taken to better understand and respond to UAP encounters? in the interest of national security. There needs to be a location where this information is centralized for processing, and there needs to be a two-way communication loop so the operators on the front end have a feedback and can can get best practices on how to process information, what to do, uh, and to ensure that they, they their reporting is being listened to. Right okay. now, okay. there is not a lot of back yeah. and forth. M Mr. Grush, in your complaint to the Intelligence Community Inspector, you, Inspector General, you claim that you believe information is being hidden. What kind of information do you think was hidden and do you think it should remain hidden? Yes, I can speak to that very briefly in an unclassified manner. As you know, the preponderance of my complaint was classified to the intelligence communities. Uh, both uh, material acquisition and exploitation activity, um, also uh, baselining the UAPs but not sharing it with, you know, intelligence professionals that are actually doing step briefs to pilots, uh, that, that kind of information. Yeah. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I always love when somebody illustrates exactly what we mean by one of the big five pieces of body language. We talk about regulators, meaning how do we control conversation or turn taking and signaling? Watch it. It's beautiful because you watch Fravor raise his thumbs. You watch him lean over. You watch Grush's face go. It's on you. And then you see Graves, who is the, the um, shaved haired guy signal him with his head. So that's a great example of what we call regulators and a way to control a conversation. Fravor, who is the gray-haired guy with the glasses, who's the guy who saw the tic-tac video, does yes in his telling tone, telling down tone. Cadence is consistent. Throughout this, his hands are folded, but he illustrates with his thumbs. And, you know, Joe Navarro says, if you're stiefling or have your hands folded and you raise your thumbs, that's confidence. So we'll take Joe's word for it. I think he knows. And then we'll look at tone. When he says nothing, listen to that change in tone. He's emphasizing nothing. His volume rises and falls when he says drop down. Then there's a request for approval. But you see that forehead up in this guy as a baseline. So there's nothing big. And then his lip compressions, I think, also mean nothing big. Now let's move to Graves. I think he has a new organization. His mission is about getting a clearinghouse for information. So he has a mission statement. You can't miss it. It sounds rote. Boom, 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 boom. It is because that's his elevator speech for his new organization, and he's very clear. You could, however, pay attention to a little lilt in his voice, and his thumbs go up when he's, he says, do you understand? Then he responds with a downtone when he's talking about these adversaries. He is telling this is dangerous. If you have a gap, then you will create an opening for the adversary. Now, in my world, I'm, a, I'm an intel guy by trade. Anytime you have a gap, it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean that aliens are there. It doesn't mean any of that. It simply means there's a gap in us reporting something because there's a stigma associated. Then we got a problem. The, the real truth about intelligence gathering is something you'll hear from me often here. I often don't make judgments on who we're talking to because that's not what intelligence gatherers do. We collect intelligence. We collect information. We collect information. It's evaluated, turns into intelligence. And so a lot of times when you get like a pilot, he's going to collect. He's not going to try to understand what it means. There are whole businesses of analysts in the background who do nothing but that. Lots of guys who never see the light of day. They simply look at information and data and move it. 
Last time um, we looked at Grush, he was less believable than he is this time. He's a little more believable because he's illustrating and moving his fingers to count. And he he does a couple of things. He does his brow down it. That's it. I'll leave it at that. This is a good start because we're talking about is there something going on? And as we go through, it'll get a lot more detail. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so there's a considerable difference, I think, between those outsiders and the insider. So physical outsiders there and and maybe, um, you know, technically outside as well or philosophically outside or anyway. Um, look, they're giving a technical story on the outside there. And so really quite believable into like why wouldn't it be they're technically yep. saying here's what we saw here's what went on grush is a whole different matter from my point of view um he doesn't answer the question what was hidden and what should remain hidden is the question he's asked um he says i'm paraphrasing that it's mostly classified he says um he says what they have and how it's used was hidden or, or maybe should remain hidden because he doesn't clarify. So he doesn't really answer the question. Let's just suspect he's saying what they have and how it's used was hidden and what these things do and how they show up was hidden. Uh, doesn't say whether it should remain hidden, which was the, the question. And then he says, well, that kind of info. Yeah. I mean, it's really a non-answer. The, the, the main problem for me is the chair totally accepts that answer and goes, okay, well, that's not an acceptable answer. He didn't answer the question, he didn't clarify to which part of the two-part question he's giving information to. Uh, he shades on the classified part of it. His head goes goes away, his eye contact goes away, and he looks for approval on the non-answer just doesn't look good and the um the questioner accepts all of that not a good start from my point of view chase what do you got on this one the day's video is sponsored by aura i'm excited for this because i've been using this app for over two years if you didn't know how much private information is out there on the internet about you when you first see it it's pretty shocking and maybe a little disturbing these people that collect all these private things about you are called data brokers, but there's a secret here. They have to take down your information if you ask them to, so they make it incredibly hard to do. So what we do is let Aura handle that for us, and you can do the same. You can let Aura do all the work tracking down and removing all the stuff that you don't want online. And you can try Aura for two weeks for free using the link uh, right at the top of the description down there. And Aura does a ton more than just getting your information off the internet. They protect you from threats that you and even your kids can't see coming. And it's super easy to set up. You don't have to go download a million different apps to get all the benefits that Aura has, like parental controls, antivirus, VPN software, password management. They even have identity theft insurance, everything. One of my friends was over here sitting in this office just a week ago, and I typed his name in, and within just a few minutes, we found everything. Even his anonymous accounts were on the dark web and the passwords associated with those. He downloaded Aura that night. So you should look into this. Your private information should be private. You can go to Aura.com slash TBP, just like the behavior panel, TBP, right now to start a free two-week trial that I've also linked down in the description. Well, I've, I've been around a lot of Navy commanders, and the behavior of these two guys on either side of Grush or whatever his name is, is very normal. By the time you become a commander in the Navy, you've been almost programmed to speak this way in an official capacity. It's clear and candid speech upfront and honest and mostly humble communication. And this typically comes from uh, spending a decade or more having to brief and, de and deliver mission briefings to higher ranking admirals and higher ranking commanders and stuff who are literally going to tear you apart, asking all these questions about every slide on your PowerPoint. And it, it, it hones them all into this. And it's almost a kind of a standard. Uh, I can only speak for the Navy. And Grouch's behavior is just a little more bizarre. And if you ever watch these other two guys and then this person, you're going to maybe be feeling like it looked like a performance. And I think this is a performance. And it starts off with this feigned eyebrow raise, 
which we typically do non-verbally to request uh, social approval from the other party, then you're hearing this sing-song voice that's artificial sounding, and his movement is also rapid and jerky. And we associate the increase in body speed with the increases in us feeling fear. And we do that when we're nervous too, and when we're trying to play a role and maybe trying too hard or nervous about whether the role is going to be believed. But finally, you hear him, hear him use the word classified in a way that I think is unusual if this wasn't a performance. I think he's using the word classified here internally and in maybe deep in his brain, maybe he did this on purpose, uh, to borrow credibility and authority by placing emphasis on the access to classified information. And I'm going to show you evidence or my evidence of what led me to this in a few videos. But it's this overly dramatized behavior. And we're going to see it in some coming videos, but I'll let you take a look at it. But if you saw this and thought something felt very artificial, forced, or contrived, then you saw the same thing we did. And all I did was act as a translator for you. Scott, what do you got? Okay, I'm glad you brought up those differences because that's what I'm going to focus on today are the differences in Grush and Graves and um, Fravor. Um, the use of illustrators of these guys is very low with the two on the outside, very low. Not We see them get, as we go through here, we'll see them use more and more. But in the beginning, not much happened at all. Whereas Grush, you get you get into what he's doing, lots of illustrators, big illustrators. You're right, Chase. It's, it's a lot of uh, expressions, facial expressions. And his the, the way he's talking is a lot different from, from them as well. His vernacular is completely different than these two guys. Now, I don't know what these the guys on each side, what their educational thing is, but I did look up Grush, and this guy's studied. He's really smart. I believe he's a must be a really smart guy, even though he does get on my nerves because he pronounces some words wrong. And but I think he knows the meanings of them, but for some reason he's pronouncing them wrong when he says nuclear and et cetera from the last time when we talked about him. But his thing is completely different than, than these other two guys. He does what I'm gonna start calling alluding and inflating information. Like he he says, there's all this stuff happening, but, you know, I can't tell you about it and stuff like that when he says and stuff like that and things like that. Or there's there's more. And we're going to hear him do that a lot. So he comes in like he's he knows all these things, but he really can't talk about it. And he gets into later on about where he wants to get into a skiff with him. And, and I'll we'll go over that as well, what that is and how it works and, and that. Not that I've been part of those, but having read up on them, I got a, I got a handle on it. I'm sure you guys will have a, a good one as well. But um, but that's where I'll focus today is on the difference in Grush and, and the two guys on the outside, because it is completely different from the way they talk to how fast they talk, to their tone of voice, to the words they use, to their structure, their sentence structure, to their paragraph structure. Their complete approach is different than his. Now, I know we've also heard maybe he's he's on the autistic, on the autism spectrum or on the spectrum, have you say grammatically correct or whatever it is correct these days, who knows? So that may be true. That may have something to do with it. I don't know. I'm just going to point out the differences in those things. All right. We good? Hey, let's, let's talk about two things since, okay. you know, people like it and we do talk about that kind of stuff. Number yeah. one, I've read that he at least says he's on the spectrum somewhere. So that can have all kinds of reasons. For that reason, we're not going to compare him to these two guys in that way, saying he's different from this guy. We're going to compare him to himself as he goes. The other thing is these two, when we talk about language, Chase, Army guys are the same way. We speak in seven word sentences. We are concise with what we say, and there's a reason for it. And add to that, both of these guys are fighter pilots or pilots. Guess how they talk most of the time on the radio? 25 word sentences are stupid on the radio. You, it makes no sense. So a lot of their communication style is going to come from that. And then what's acceptable? An Air Force guy who's in the intelligence business is going to have a very different thing. So it's worth us pointing those things out. The other thing is these two guys, probably their amygdala doesn't respond quite as quickly to stress as his does. That's something for us to keep in mind. Based off of each of your experiences and observations, do you believe UAPs pose a potential threat to our national security? I'll do it. Yes, and here's why. The, the technology that we faced was far superior than anything that we had, and you could put that anywhere. If you, if you had one, you captured one, you reverse engineered it, you got it to work, you're talking something that can go into space, go someplace, drop down in a matter of seconds, 
do whatever it wants and leave, and there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing. Okay. Either the other you two. Well, I would also like to add from a commercial aviation and military aviation perspective, we deal with uncertainty in our operating space as a matter of, uh, of our protection, professional actions. Identifying friend from foe is, is very important to us. Uh, and so when we have unidentified targets and we continue to ignore those due to a stigma or a fear of what it could be, that's an opening that our adversaries can take advantage of. What, what, what uh, steps should be taken to better understand and respond to UAP encounters? in the interest of national security. There needs to be a location where this information is centralized for processing, and there needs to be a two-way communication loop so the operators on the front end have a feedback and can, can get best practices on how to process information, what to do, uh, and to ensure that they, they, their reporting is being listened to. Right okay. now, okay. there is not a lot of back yeah. and forth. M Mr. Grush, in your complaint to the Intelligence Community Inspector, you, Inspector General, you claim that you believe information is being hidden. What kind of information do you think was hidden and do you think it should remain hidden? Yes, I can speak to that very briefly in an unclassified manner. As you know, the preponderance of my complaint was classified to the intelligence communities. Uh, both uh, material acquisition and exploitation activity, um, also uh, baselining the UAPs but not sharing it with, you know, intelligence professionals that are actually doing step briefs to pilots, uh, that, that kind of information. Yeah. Okay. And so will you just, for the public record, again, once, once again, um, just uh, briefly uh, dis either describe or note that aircraft that are being witnessed, particularly by the 30 folks that you're working with, are essentially outside the scope of anything that we know of today and the technology we have today. Mr. Graves, Mr. Fravor? Yes. Uh, the objects that are being seen by commercial pilots are uh, performing maneuvers that are unexplainable due to our current understanding of our technology and our capabilities as a country. And that applies for the military as well. Mr. 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 Fur. Yeah, I concur with that. We have nothing that can stop in midair and go the other direction, nor do we have anything that can, like in our situation, come down from space, hang out for three hours, and go back up. Thank you. My last question, and, so, and sometimes you, I know that some, you have also said some of these answers in the past, but we're trying to get them on the public record as well, which is really important. Mr. Gresh, finally, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General and some of which to the Intelligence Committees. I actually had the people with the first-hand knowledge um, provide a protected disclosure to the Inspector General. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would just say that I think that these questions are important questions, and I look forward to uh, being involved in the process to get those answered. I know there will be a lot of questions from other committee members, so I yield back. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Burchard himself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia. I would like to have you on the, my legislation to do just that on the, on the reporting, um, and we'll get together on that. Maybe you can be my co-sponsor on that. That'd be really cool. Thank you for those great questions. Um, Mr. Graves, again, I'd like to know, um, how do you know that these were not our aircraft? Some of the behaviors that we saw in a working area, we would see these objects uh, being at 0.0, .0 Mach, that's zero airspeed, over certain pieces of the ground. So what that means, just like a river, if you throw a bobber in, it's going to float downstream. These objects were staying completely stationary in Category 4 hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. Okay. Have you spoken to um, commercial and military pilots um, that have seen these off of our East Coast? I have. Okay. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so the question there, essentially, where are the UA UAPs kept? What's the location? Where are they kept? I actually had people with first-hand knowledge. I actually had people with first-hand knowledge, and there's, a again, eyebrow raise and look for approval. Um the gold watch guy in the back, I'm going to call him the gold watch guy. It's, it's Jeremy Corbell, and you may know who Corbell is or not, and I'll tell you a little about, bit about him uh, um, later. But one of the interesting things about nonverbal communication is the location that, that things happen and who else is there, what else is happening there. And Corbell has a, uh, looks to me, a lovely, lovely watch. Um, seems to me 
uh, like a yacht master in many ways, but with with a Speedmaster um, uh, or Daytona dial on it. So I don't know if it's a Franken watch of some sort or, or made by a, a, a manufacturer that I don't quite understand. So put in the list below what uh, Corbell's very nice gold watch is there. Clearly makes makes a good living, uh, whatever he's up to. Um, he uh, adapts in his seat around this idea of knowing people with first-hand knowledge. So some kind of stimulus to him around this first-hand knowledge. I know Corbell wanted to speak himself at this event, and and the chair actually thanked him for organising this, this event. So he's a little hot in the seat there at this point. He says, uh, and, and um, Grush says that these people with first-hand knowledge provided uh, protected disclosure to the inspector uh, general. Um, and then he barriers and protects joints on that. So clearly there's something, there's some uh, unbalance there around around where they're kept and does does he really know where they're kept and who else wants to speak uh, around this? Anyway, uh, Jeremy Corbell knows uh, Grush uh, because they met at a Star Trek convention. Um, uh, apparently, uh, uh, Grush uh, approached Corbell at a Star Trek convention. Corbell is a is a UFO media creator and relies on the idea of strange phenomenon and the doubt and the mystery around strange phenomenon for his for his um, living. And the chair says, made this happen. So so somebody who the chair is saying is the instigator of this event is sitting behind, and it may be interesting to watch his reactions uh, to all of this. You'll, you'll see him on shows on the History Channel, uh, Skinwalker, Skin, Skin, yeah, Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, place owned by um, uh, the the aerospace engineer Bigelow, uh, by the way, got a twenty two million dollar contract in order to investigate his own property. Interesting, interesting. What's going? Uh, confusing. Kind of a little confused. Uh, Chase, shed some light on any of it for me. What you got? So we're we're seeing these two commanders here still just being commanders here, candid, honest, and and most of all, they are themselves. That's a big deal. They are acting like themselves. The Grouch, Grouch guy, we're still seeing these rapid jerky movements, which we associate with fear. Fear makes us move faster. We're seeing these vocal clicks, and I cannot believe that Mark did not talk about this and mimic the sound. I'll for get you guys. Uh, I'm sorry you missed that. But... Uh, and so just this weird permanent eyebrow raise. It's just strange. And there's an immediate mouth closure and lip compression. It might be baseline for him, but I think it's only baseline for this persona or whatever you'd like to call it that he's using for this. I'm just going to call it a campaign. Whatever's going on here, I'll call it a campaign. And one thing you're going to see a lot of amateur actors do, and Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is place emphasis on the wrong words in their speech. You're definitely seeing that here. It's like, I don't know where I was going to. So you're hearing this emphasis That's on Star Trek. words. <laughs> yeah. When he's talking about ha uh, uh, having these people with firsthand knowledge provide reports, something makes him fearful. And there's this unusual arm cross that you're seeing at this moment. I wish I could figure it out fully. Uh, then there's this hand uh, or hard mouth closure with lip compression again, which we see in people who are being withholding. And these signals are occurring in a cluster. They're a deviation from his normal behavior. And it, in this context, the rapid shift into this body position is also unusual. So I'm going to plant one giant red flag right here that something is either untruthful or deliberately misleading about that statement. So you see no desire in these two commanders to make this dramatic or to garner some kind of status from any of this. And it looks so far like we're seeing the opposite with this person in the middle. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think um, Grush's answer ends with a huge adapter. The other two guys, they're adapting some, not a whole lot, a lot of thumb work going on, which is fine because they're they're sitting the way they should. They're 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 looking professional. 
And like you said, they're they're acting as commanders, which is what they do. And this is what, again, separates uh, these two on the outside from Grush. Um, and what he's saying is pretty much hearsay. These guys are giving you facts, seeing things they've seen or and seen with other people. In my opinion, what they're talking about is just saying, here's what I saw. Here's what I saw. Here's what happened. Whereas Grush hadn't really seen anything but reports about what he's seen. And who knows if that's true or not. For example, when you when we hear about the uh, 73855 rule of communication, we know Albert Moravian, because um, I talked to him and asked him years ago, that's not that whole thing is 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 not true because not the whole thing but there was people took two different studies and put them together and came up with this thing that, that became the 73855 rule of communication look up the the 73855 myth google it you'll see what i'm talking about and you still can go out and read that that looks like it's true but it's not true same thing with with grush he could be reading all this stuff and he's presenting it presenting it as facts or it's just in court, it would be hearsay, I believe, if I'm correct about that. There's nothing. He didn't see anything except reports. Later on, he says he's seen the ships or the spaceships or whatever. Right now, all he's saying is he's seen the uh, heard reports or read reports about that stuff. Um, and then Graves, this guy, is, he's on it, man. He's prepared. This is a guy, I bet you he made straight A's and all that. And doesn't mess around. I bet he's doing really well in whatever his gig is in the Navy. I bet he's doing great because he's one of those guys that's real serious. He's getting everything done. He's marked, he's, he's everything he's talking about explaining gets clocked off just like it should. It's almost perfect. He's studied in this and his delivery is perfect. The the words he's using, his sentence structure, all those things make those pictures in your mind of a very analytical situation here's what happened he is getting some information from other people because he talks about that but he's also talking about his his own experience as well and then you have um fravor this guy if you don't believe he saw what he's saying he saw then you're watching the right channel because we're going to show you how to how to know he's telling you the truth or how so what someone looks like when they look on it when they're being honest that's him that's exactly what it looks like so, and then compare those two to Grush. I'm not saying Grush is lying. I'm just saying he's not giving you information from a first person's perspective. He didn't see anything, but he read a bunch of reports. So that's the difference in those in, in those two. That's at this. These happened uh, not from the very beginning of of the uh, the hearing, but as you go through that, it just gets worse and worse, and it gets worse and worse in here because he really didn't have that much to say about anything except the same things over and over. Whereas these other two guys can say, oh yeah, here also this happened. Here's what I saw. And you see the the proper excitement happen with these guys. With Grush, you don't see the proper excitement. Like Chase was saying, see this fake light up with them and this fake excitement, the fake and not fake expressions, but they're they they look the whole thing is squirrely to me with this guy. So that's why take on the comparison there. Let's think about number one. Let's start off by talking about why he would be different. First of all, he's not a band member. He's not a musician. He's a manager. He This guy's seen nothing. He's seen secondhand everything. So let's talk about that first. Let's talk about what that might do to him. But there are lots of red flags. The biggest one, Chase, we're on the same page. That one red flag in the ground that I'm all over right now is that body cross and that sudden change in cadence. And all of those things when he talks about somebody doing protected disclosure. Why? I'm with you, Chase. We can't tell. We can't. Maybe he got reamed for something around that. And so he's feeling awkward. Maybe something else. Maybe there's he's making it up. We can't tell that. The good news is we don't try to pretend we can read minds. We're just telling you what we see. Let's also then talk about hearsay. Scott, here's the difference. So when we talk about hearsay in court, even in, in intelligence, it's even worse in intelligence. You have to caveat that what you have is hearsay. Not only do you have to caveat what you have is hearsay, who did you hear it from? How did they know? And what's the date of the information? Every time you write a note, if I say Scott Rouse saw a UFO, who told you that? Mark. When did Mark find out? And what date? You know, so you got to clarify all of those pieces. So this guy's living in a second or third hand world, and he's sitting between two guys who have seen what's going on. He's probably read their reports over and over and over. It's a little bit like us going and talking to somebody that we've kind of idolized or that kind of thing. So he's sitting between them. We're going to see a lot of body language that tells us that as we go through this. So I think part of his fear is coming from that. The other part is we've already said we didn't believe the guy at times. So there's a whole lot of reasons for him to show fear. Let's talk about why we know the other two are telling the truth. Boom, boom, boom. They're telling you facts. Their hands are folded more out of boredom than anything else or more out of we as military people learn to stand a certain way, sit a certain way, do certain things. 
There's finishing schools for colonels, for, for commanders, same thing, 06, as we're talking about. Those guys have been in the career. They're going to move and behave a certain way. It just is. It's just part of the culture. These guys also are fighter pilots. That's another level of, even in the military, everybody's going to say, well, Grush is trained to resist interrogation because he's at a high level in the government. No, nope, probably not, because there's no reason for us to train a guy who works on internal work. Guess who is trained to resist interrogation? Both of those guys sitting on his sides. And they've been through the Navy school, which is the hardest school. Just I'll say that out loud. Somebody in the Air Force or the Army will say, no, this is harder, that's harder. The physically hardest school in the military is the Navy at Brunswick, or was. I don't know about now. Uh, so then as they get into here, Graves does a lot of eyelock, and we're paying attention to this. But I, and I was getting a little nervous when he's talking about what the shapes of them were. But when he starts to illustrate, his thumbs come up to point out everything, and his hands start to move. Grush has a list of things. And I think part of it is because maybe, like we said before, he says he's on the spectrum, so we give him benefit of that. We don't know. We haven't been involved with him. But that's going to give him weird, quirky, or odd outside of mainline body language. So it can. I, but there's the reason I say he is a manager, there's a production quality to everything he says. Everything feels like it's big. Everything feels like it's prepared. These guys are going, nope, that didn't happen. Yep, this happened. Nope, nope, that, yep, yep, this, speed. And his head, his forehead is always up in a in request for approval. That last embrace just makes us, every one of us, want to go, hold on a minute. Something changed, and why? But the people who are sitting on Congress don't have our training. And so will you just, for the public record, again, once, once again, um, just... Uh, briefly uh, dis either describe or note that aircraft that are being witnessed, particularly by the 30 folks that you're working with, are essentially outside the scope of anything that we know of today and the technology we have today. Mr. Graves, Mr. Fravor? Yes, uh, the objects that are being seen by commercial pilots are uh, performing maneuvers that are unexplainable due to our current understanding of our technology and our capabilities as a country, and that applies for the military as well. Mr. 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 Fravor? Yeah, I concur with that. We have nothing that can stop in midair and go the other direction, nor do we have anything that can, like in our situation, come down from space, hang out for three hours, and go back up. Thank you. My last question, and, so, and sometimes you, I know that some, you have also said some of these answers in the past, but we're trying to get them on the public record as well, which is really important. Mr. Gresh, finally, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General and some of which to the Intelligence Committees. I actually had the people with the firsthand knowledge um, provide a protected disclosure to the Inspector General. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would just say that I think that these questions are important questions, and I look forward to uh, being involved in the process to get those answered. I know there will be a lot of questions for the committee members, so I yield back. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Richard himself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia. I would like to have you on the, my legislation to do just that on the, on the reporting, um, and we'll get together on that. Maybe you can be my co-sponsor on that. That'd be really cool. Thank you for those great questions. Um, Mr. Graves, again, I'd like to know, um, how do you know that these were not our aircraft? Some of the behaviors that we saw in a working area, we would see these objects uh, being at 0.0, .0 Mach, that's zero airspeed over certain pieces of the ground. So what that means, just like a river, if you throw a bobber in, it's going to float downstream. These objects were staying completely stationary in category four hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach. Uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. Okay. Have you spoken to um, commercial and military pilots um, that have seen these off of our East Coast? I have. Okay. Um, Mr. Favor, do you believe that you witnessed an additional object under the water in relation to your encounter? I will say we did not see an object. There was something there to cause the white water, and when we turned around, it was gone, so there was something there that obviously moved. Okay, it was it was not the same object though that you were you were looking at, correct? No, we actually joked that the Tic Tac was communicating with something when we came back, and could, because the white water disappeared. Uh, we were in, in another instance. We're told about the capabilities of of a jamming during viewing of some when there were some people chasing some of these objects. Did you experience any of that jamming or interrupting your radar or weapon system? 
My crew that launched after we landed experienced significant jamming to the APG-73 radar, which was what we had on board, which is a mechanically scanned, very high-end uh, system prior to the APG-79. And yes, it did pretty much everything you could do, range, velocity, aspect, and then it <coughs> spit the lock, and the targeting pod is passive. That's what we were able to get the video on. I'm about to run out of time, but um, are you aware of any of our enemies that have that capability? No. Okay. I All right, Chase, what do you got? When he's asking, do you believe that you saw this object underwater? This moment, if somebody wanted to leverage this for some other reason than truth, would have taken advantage and made a more vague remark about something being there, or you know what, there was white water there, which means something had to be there. Instead, you're seeing a clear admission of his lack of certainty, a clear admission of his lack of certainty. And he just continues using simple language with no dramatized, nothing deliberately vague uh, to make himself more important or to elevate the dramatic aspects of that story. And the APG-73 that we're hearing about is mechanically scanned versus the 79, which they refer to in here, which is electronically scanned. So it's essentially more, way more advanced in its technology. It's a smaller package because it has less moving parts, so it's more capable of distinguishing aircraft that are closer together traveling in formation. It's kind of what that means. And he's talking about something called the ECM or electronic countermeasures here, which the 79 is a lot more resistant to. So just to give you some background, I know a little bit of, about these radars from working in the in the military. So he's what he's trying to illustrate is that even the more advanced radars are vulnerable to this. And that's, he doesn't try to hammer that down your throat. He communicates this in a way that a commander would communicate it to another commander. And when he's talking about this thing, uh, this pod, this is actually called a FLIR, forward-looking infrared is the acronym, being passive. And that just means that it's not sending out signals from the aircraft when he, when he says that. And I mention all this because he's answering questions in a way that he's, not feeling a need to explain how dramatic this is for effect. And that is a huge deal for me when it comes to uh, determining who in that room, which more lies have been told in that room right there than just about anywhere else. So uh, watching stuff in that room, this is one of the ways, just keep, write it down uh, to see this. Are they comfortable doing what you just saw in this clip here? Greg? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of things. One of the things that you do when you're an operator, when you're a pilot, and Chase, you probably had some of this in your experience, is when you come back from a mission, there's a guy like me there to talk to you, an interrogator whose secondary mission is debriefing to figure out what happened on the mission, any human piece of it. And you get accustomed when you do that a lot to answering questions the way they're answering questions. That's number one. Number two is this guy is just telling facts because, well, they wouldn't ask you, hey, what did you think it was? That's not my in my business, we don't care what you thought it was. We want to know what you saw, and we'll ask you a ton of questions about it. Chase, I'm sure you've seen that. The other thing is, I always say these words: alphas don't strut. Folks around the alphas strut. This is a great example. Kind of laid back. Both the two guys on the left and right are like, yeah, 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 whatever. The guy in the middle is doing all this performance art that we're seeing, and I think part of it is that you know, if you want to feel inferior, and you're kind of a guy who is a, a desk jockey, let's assume he is. You should, certainly would feel a little bit of that sitting between an F-18 pilot and I forget what Fravor flew. But those guys are, you know, they're at the top of their heap and everybody knows it. Even Chase, you've been around the Navy, you've been on boats where those guys are, I'm sure. Those guys are kind of the top of their heap. It's just where they're at. Um, so let's talk about how we know he's being truthful. Consistent cadence. Doesn't sound like a repetition. This is not rote. He's not going to bump, a bump, a bump, a bump. He's just talking. His cadence changes, speeds up and slows down as he tries to make a point, as he talks about the detail. He pauses at the right spot when he says, we joke, bump, 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 because. That's a good indicator this is not rehearsed or practiced. The concern when he talks, uh, see that concern in his face as he talks about jamming and his thumbs start to adapt more? That's a good indicator something's going on. And then when you take that telling tone, this is all really believable stuff, much different than what we're going to see a little bit later from some other folks. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you. That's what I was going to get on as well was, again, we're seeing everything that looks like it's that looks like someone's being honest, like they're telling you what they saw and what happened. One thing I found interesting is, and we were talking about him earlier, the guy in the back 
and uh, uh, he, he's not wearing a suit. What's his name? Corbell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Watch his hands, what he's doing, and then watch Fravor's hands. They they match. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody says, oh, there's some conspiracy conspiracy thing that comes out. Goes, oh, these guys are connected because when he does this, the other one does this. So and I think that because when Corbell is listening, he just keeps shaking. He keeps doing his head. Yes, as he's agreeing with him, almost like I'm part of this as well. I don't know what his role is in this. I don't know any, anything or I've seen him on the Internet before, but I, I don't get into all the UFO things. But I think somebody might put those together and say, oh, they're in they're in cahoots or something or, or he's connected somehow. Um so I thought that was really interesting. But we're seeing all the things that let you know someone's being honest. We talk about the uh, Vray's studies out at Vray. When it's, the more illustrations you use, the more honest you're being. Well, in this case, we know from their baseline, we're not there. Our Fravor isn't using a whole lot of, of illustrators. They're very small. They, you know, use his thumbs and they go up showing confidence and 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 what he's saying. We see, I think zero uh, cues that say he's unsure and being deceptive. We don't see anything like that. His, like Greg was saying, his cadence stays the same. His volume stays the same, except when he gets more excited about what he's talking about. He's excited about this. He really is being able to tell you what he saw. And he knows this is a big deal. So I think everything we're seeing with him so far has just been uh, completely honest about what he has seen, his experience in this. Not a secondhand, you know, somebody told me, or this is what I read or whatever. He's saying what happened. And I think out of all the things, we, all the people we've seen on here that we've had in question, this guy looks the most like he's telling the truth so far. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, Chase, lies in Congress. I mean, I can't agree with that. We, you've got James <laughs> Clapper in the background there. He's always been <laughs> right up, honest guy in Congress. So I, I have no, I apologize to everybody. I don't I'm know Chase. Chase is talking about that. Um, you know, so always pay attention to who people are are around and and uh though i think you know these stand-up guys at the, at the side on the periphery are uh, on as you say uh scott are not connected to my understanding with corbell but certainly the guy in the center is very much connected with with corbell and the other uh writer to the side of his his lawyer it's it's uh Grush's lawyer who's 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 behind him um who uh Anyway, we'll talk about him later. But anyway, um, Fravan, uh, like stand-up guy. I mean, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't have anybody who's delivering something, you know, more accurately and more factually. I mean, that's the kind of person he is. That's his that's his his role, and he fulfills that role very well. However, one little mistake, I think, and I really do think it is a mistake. Uh, the questioner says, did you experience jamming? Did you experience jamming? He says, my crew that landed, uh, my crew that landed after, no, sorry, my crew that launched after we landed experienced significant jamming. Well, that, unless I've got that wrong, that suggests that he did not experience jamming, but a second crew that went out experienced uh, jamming. It, you, uh, I may have that wrong. And at the end of that, there feels to me, though he's he's very strong uh, with his with his hands, a little bit of soothing at the end there. So my 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 thoughts might be is maybe he understands he maybe hasn't been quite accurate with that. Uh, answer, but I don't think he's trying to be deceptive uh, about that. But there, there may be a little more secondhand information there. But maybe I've got that that wrong. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Yeah, and Mark, he could be talking about his crew, you know, his team, because he, he's right. a commander. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Mr. Favor. Do you believe that you witnessed an additional object under the water in relation to your encounter? I will say we did not see an object. There was something there to cause the white water, and when we turned around, it was gone, so there was something there that obviously moved. Okay, it was, it was not the same object, though, that you were, you were looking at, correct? No, we actually joked that the Tic Tac was communicating with something when we came back and could, because the white water disappeared. Uh, we were in, in another instance. We're told about the capabilities of, of a jamming during viewing of some when there were some people chasing some of these objects. Did you experience any of that jamming or interrupting your radar or weapon system? 
My crew that launched after we landed experienced significant jamming to the APG-73 radar, which was what we had on board, which is a mechanically scanned, very high-end uh, system prior to the APG-79. And yes, it did pretty much everything you could do, range, velocity, aspect, and then it <coughs> spit the lock, and the targeting pod is passive. That's what we were able to get the video on. I'm about to run out of time, but um, are you aware of any of our enemies that have that capability? No. Okay. I um, are there common characteristics to the UAPs that have been cited by different pilots, and can you describe what the convergence of descriptions is? Certainly. Uh, we were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. I'm sorry, dark gray or black cubes? Yes, inside yeah. of a clear sphere, where the apex or tips of the cube were touching the inside of that sphere. And that was primarily what was being reported when we were able to gain a visual tally of these objects. And that occurred over almost eight years. And as far as I know, it's still occurring. Um, so the, I take it that you're arguing what we need is real transparency in a reporting system so we can get some clarity on what's going on out there because there are many pilots in your situation, um, but we should have a, a way of developing a syst systematic inventory of all of such encounters. Is that right? Yes, and I think we need both transparency and the reporting. We have the reporting, but we need to make sure that information can be promulgated to commercial aviation as well as the rest of the populace. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, his illustrators and voice are up at the same time every time he hits a key point or a feature. Then when the guy asks him and repeats what he says, he just affirms, yeah, that's it. When somebody's trying to persuade you of something, they're going to take every opportunity to reinforce that you believe them. I see it all the time. If you'd said this and then the guy goes, boom, you go, you know, you glom onto him and suddenly become his best friend. Yeah, that's exactly what we saw. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see it a lot in people who are being deceptive. So that very calm, yep, that's what we saw. And then to give you the rest of the details, I think is a really good indicator. Then his hands illustrate when he's talking about the apexes and he's talking about things touching the inside of the sphere, his hands start to illustrate more than he normally does. Again, Scott, back to Veray, who says larger illustrators are better indicators of the truth. And if you watch it, he's not just talking about his own knowledge. He's talking about reports that he's picked up from these times. And you can tell a difference when he's talking about that. You, what you, what If you want a really good baseline for this guy, when they start asking about the need for reporting, that's absolutely his normal communication style because he's got no reason to lie about that. We're going to see the same thing in Grush later. When we get a few videos in, we're going to see him when he's normally talking about something. He's talking about evaluating reports. That's what we call baseline. What we don't call baseline is you sitting at home on your couch eating Cheetos. What we're talking about is how do you behave normally when you're talking about something that's zero stress. So I think that's a good point. And I think we're seeing really truthful indicators here. So both Fravor and Graves are both giving us truthful indicators. Uh, Chase, what do you got? It, yeah, this is what it should look like. Clear communication that's understandable. And when something is described, you can even picture it in your mind. Can you picture it if someone describes something? So there's no attempt to sell anything here. And he's not on a mission to deliver drama or to push some narrative. And there's no behaviors that I saw that were indicative of heightened stress, over-dramatizing behavior, acting, uh, what all of us might refer to as linguistic deception checklist behaviors, none of which we're hearing here in this clip with Mr. Graves. And both of these two fighter pilots on either side are displaying some stress signals. The difference between social stress and deception stress is that social stress permeates and stays relatively constant and doesn't just spike up into this mountain right when a certain topic comes up. So that's uh, another thing that we're looking for. What's the context? And then are we seeing that stress just spike up in a context? We're seeing them just doing these small little pacifying behaviors. So when you see some of these that we typically call stress indicators, keep in mind that it's pretty constant throughout. They're on camera, they're doing all this stuff. That's a normal and predictable social stress, and that's where we use context to identify what we're really looking at. Scott? All right. Let's talk about steepling. Quite often people will take this for steepling. It's actually really not. This is steepling. You use all your fingers and you're like, ah, oh, I'm the guy who knows everything. But what we're seeing here, this is confidence. 
and going back to to Joe Navarro, we talk about every episode. Uh, he's uh, he's where I I was first focused on that was was Joe's um, books talking about how when the thumbs are up, that indicates it denotes confidence. And I think that's what we're seeing. The guy has no problem telling you what he saw. He doesn't feel weird or goofy about it. He's not like, well, there's this sphere and it had a cube in it. None of that. He's saying there was a sphere and it had a cube in it. And it was touching on the side. He's telling you the way it is. So that's that's confidence. We did see one tiny little shoulder shrug there as he's, as he's describing that uh, square thing in the cube inside the circle. But I think I think that is just in this case, I don't think it really means much at all. I think he's as he's. I think he's watched his mouth up to this point, so I think he's being kind of careful. And I, I think maybe that's why I see that little that quick little pop there, real quick. Um, uh, and he's still using these really perfectly crafted and tight analytical phrases and descriptions as he's telling what happened. Uh, and that's that's tough to do unless you've actually been there. Or you sat there and studied exactly what you're going to say. His is flowing too easily to be studied and to be, um, I have to say this, this, and this, because there, there are no hard stops or anything. It's just flowing right out and nothing changes. It just keeps coming out at normal speed. Again, this is what it looks like when you're telling the truth. People are always in the comments, and we do read all the comments, uh, all that we can. Um, they always say, show us something where somebody's telling the truth. Well, right here you're seeing two of them, that I would put all my cards on and telling the truth. The guys on the outside are being completely honest with you. And this guy Graves, I think he's he's such an analytical. If he were to, to start being deceptive, I think it would just start flagging right and left, and we'd have no problem at all pointing out things on this guy. I think he's, he's solid, so that's why the, it's so easy to read him being honest, because that's what he's like, I think, all the time. He's being honest about that. Um, but he he has he is prepared for this, but he's not prepared phrase by phrase and hitting specific things for each answer like that the way I'm under the impression that Grush is. Let's talk about this. Is it Grush, Grouch, Gro, Groove? I think it's what, Grush. Is, Grush. 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 Okay. This, okay. Um, so that's, again, that's the difference in the two guys on the outside and the guy in, in, in the middle. Or I, I just keep getting yeah, the guy. Grush is a little bit squirrely. For me, comparatively, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with all of you. Uh, both uh, Fravon and who's the other guy? Not Grush. Fravon Fravon. Graves. Yeah, yeah. Graves. Graves. Both of them have had ample opportunity, if they wanted to, to create a very dramatic story. You know, they've been given yeah. many opportunities to expand and be gregarious with it and really create something very, very exciting for us. And they're not taking that opportunity. And what I see with people who are often, you know, shown to be uh, being dishonest is they take those opportunities and they haven't. And that's I think that's really key. Now, um, so there, there seems to be a bit of show business Happen, happening in the center there. There's some, also some so show business there from uh, Raskin, who's asking the question there, because he repeats the description, the um, the 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 cube within the within the orb um, is is what's described. And he says, "Hang on, you know, a cube, a, 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 a cube within an orb," and and, and then the the. The, the guy has to repeat it again. So we hear that description now three times. It's like you heard it. We, you didn't need to repeat it, and you didn't need to get him to repeat it. So, so why do we need this repetition of this? Well, what is a a a Euclidean enigma? Which is how do you get? How do you square the circle? How do you? How, what is that enigma of pi? The 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 square within the orb. How does that fit? Because that's a beautiful piece of geometry that's being described there. And and for my, I mean, I'm not a, a ufologist, but but that seems quite new to me. That seems all right. This is a new description. I've heard about the tic tac stuff, but this thing seems pretty new. Why do you need to keep repeating this new idea? to me and and why is it so what is what a wonderful beautiful uh idea and why do we need drama around this and yet you know the describer of it doesn't want to join in on that drama doesn't need to anyway interesting seems to be a lot of show business from the inquirers and some show business in the center and there's definitely some show business 
in the background there, um, but not really any show business from those outsiders there. Maybe they're not in show business. I'm not. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's all I got on that one. Right. Okay, Chase, I give you that one. Thank you, sir. It's been too long. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you earned it. Um, are there common characteristics to the UAPs that have been cited by different pilots, and can you describe what the convergence of descriptions is? Certainly. Uh, we were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. I'm sorry, dark gray or black cubes? Yes, inside yeah. of a clear sphere, where the apex or tips of the cube were touching the inside of that sphere. And that was primarily what was being reported when we were able to gain a visual tally of these objects. And that occurred over almost eight years. And as far as I know, it's still occurring. Um, so the, I take it that you're arguing what we need is real transparency in a reporting system so we can get some clarity on what's going on out there because there are many pilots in your situation, um, but we should have a, a way of developing a sy systematic inventory of all of such encounters. Is that right? Yes, and I think we need both transparency and the reporting. We have the reporting, but we need to make sure that information can be promulgated to commercial aviation as well as the rest of the populace. <laughs> Let's talk about the laws of physics for a second. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Graves and, and Commander Favor, I heard you talk about speed. When uh, those objects broke uh, the sound barrier, did they make a sonic boom? I was in a jet. You can't hear anything. It's kind of loud in there. Yeah, you, you're not able to actually uh, personally tell within the vehicle. I will say the objects that we were seeing, they were spherical, uh, and they were observed up to Mach 2, uh, which is a very uh, non-aerodynamic shape. What about G-forces? Let's talk about G-forces of those vehicles. Could a human survive those G-forces with known technology today? No. No, not for the acceleration rates that we observed. Okay. What about what they look like? How close did you get? Did you see a seam or a rivet? or a section, and what I mean is, obviously, the jets you're flying have all those things. Did these objects have those? Do you want to go, Ryan? I didn't have, I didn't have the detail to be able to tell that. So we got within a half mile of Tic Tac, which people say that's pretty far, but it's, in airplanes, that's actually relatively close. No, it was perfectly white, smooth, no windows, although when we did take the original FLIR video that is out there, when you put it on a big screen, it actually had two little objects that came out of the bottom of it. Um, but other than that, no, no windows, no seams, no nothing. All right, Chase, what do you got? Here's a list of what I'm initially looking for in this video. So we, I'm, I'm looking for changes in tone, volume, speed, cadence, or pitch. I'm looking for hesitancy and vagueness and the absence of details. And I mean detail absence for a specific thing where a person is being very detailed in what they're saying, and all of a sudden, the detail falls out of their story and vagueness just jumps in. And I think lastly, I want to look for nervousness spikes and stress indicators that occur around these specific topics. There's none of this here. There are at least three topics that are brought up uh, that these people could have easily made into something dramatic, mysterious, scary, or more newsworthy than it should be. And I use that word deliberately here because it seems like there's somebody uh, deliberately shifting things from a boring fact to a dramatic news worry worthy uh, bit of information. That's all I got. Mark. Okay. So I think what we get here from uh, Muscovitz, I think is the, is the guy's name um, uh, inquiring is some skeptical questioning. I think it's skeptical questioning because he says, let's talk about the laws of physics. And then there's a <clears throat> cough afterwards. I think that cough is a territorial cough. He's like, there, I've marked out my territory. We're going for the laws of physics here. Let's see whether you can handle um, handle those. So he marks out his territory of of how he's going to... Um, question it's a bit like it's a bit like the movement of the hair before somebody makes some kind of a attack it's to mark out here come the big guns i'm bringing out the laws of physics anyway um uh the pilot here brings up the idea of the sonic boom and you can't hear a sonic boom in cry inside the aircraft i don't know whether that's uh true or not but uh but anyway grush and george knapp and james clapper in the background they all enjoy that little 
palpable hit there. We can see their enjoyment of that little manoeuvre. Grouch adapts on his papers with wide fingers at that, and there's a there's a smile of content at that hit. This movement here, watch that movement. It doesn't need to be done. His papers don't need moving at all. That's why I don't think he's much liked in the office. That he's the, you know, he comes across, you know, see, there's point scored, mm, manoeuvre the papers there. I don't think, you know, I think, I don't think he's got that many friends. In, I could be wrong, could be very well loved in the office, but I don't think with that kind of behaviour, he is. But that's just me. That's just me. Um, Chase, what do you, what do you got? No, hang on, we've had Chase. Who we got? Greg? Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, no. Scott, what do you got in this? Sorry, you can go, Greg. Okay, whatever. Um, so let, let's first start by talking about personality types. These guys are a certain personality type. They're recruited. They're they're created. These, these fighter pilots are created because they have a certain personality type. They're not dramatic. This other guy, he might have been in the chess club versus the playing hockey or something. Who knows? But certain personalities are more drawn to drama and to over dramatizing whatever they're doing i think we got one of those now does that mean he's lying not necessarily but it will make him aggrandize things that don't matter in a way and chase i think you said it over and over and over these guys are just facts just telling you what they saw they operate in a tangent in a in a concrete world this guy doesn't necessarily it feels like I also say there's no qual qualified no qualification to be a member of Congress. So asking a question about something like this and stepping your foot in the bear trap and looking kind of silly is par for the course if you step in there. In the interrogation world, we talk to people who do things that we have no frame of reference for all the time. It's the reason we have questioning guides. We have all kinds of manuals. We'll walk in and pick up a manual and spend two hours prepping to talk to somebody. I've talked to people about chemical weapons. What do I know about them? what I read. So you get a frame of reference to be able to talk. You might want to read that about what it's like to fly, you know, a, a fighter before you ask questions about sound, for example. This guy was just doing, I think, in his own mind, due diligence, and it just blew up on him. Fravor, what I say here is we always want definitions. I said there's a definition of regulators earlier. This is a definition of congruency. What I look for in a person, and Chase, you hit some of them as well, I look for cadence of speech. I look for volume. I look for tone. I look for choice of words. I look for illustrators all to be the same. I look for facial expressions and movement. I look for all of that, volume, everything to be the same. And listen to this guy, very good details. His illustrators are pointing what he's saying, pointing, counting on his hands, and his mouth and brain are saying exactly what his body's saying. That's a definition of congruency. That's what we look for. If you were doing that and I were questioning you, I might say, hey, you, you, you can leave. I, I got no time to waste on you. Let me talk to your friend in the middle because he doesn't look like that. The interesting piece for Grush, Chase, or Scott, he's got your extra face is what all that is, in my opinion. When he does the paper moving, I think he's trying to control what he can because he's sitting between two people that he feels awkward and he doesn't feel like he adds a whole lot. Oh, let's also add to that if he's on the spectrum somewhere, he probably is an odd guy out. But he's on stage right now where really important facts are coming out. He didn't have any. So look for the extra face. I think Scotty's got that better than anybody. What do you got, Scott? Uh, I think you nailed it. Yeah, and another interesting thing going back to what everybody's been talking about is let's take a look at what's in front of these guys on the table. As they're sitting there, you can tell a whole lot about this. Uh, when you there was a guy named Michael Bertram, and and he he was the uh, CEO at the uh, national or yeah at the National Entrepreneur Center. And one day we were talking, and he said, "When this guy comes in, watch all the stuff he puts out on the on the <laughs> table there. Watch how he claims his territory." Uh, and so we got to talk about that because I had an understanding that I was like, "Wow, so you know, you're not the, I'm not the only one that sees those things." And so what this guy Grush is doing is he's laying out all the, look at all the stuff he has in front of him. He's got papers, like Mark was saying, and, and Greg and chasing him, and he's moving this stuff around. He's got a lot going on in there. He's got so many things he needs to check on and read, <clears throat> excuse me, and go back over and make sure everything's cool with what he's saying. But you look at Graves, he's got like this little bitty square thing that he never touches, and a pencil, and you look at Fravor, and he's got just like this little, might be one piece of paper. There's not much there at all. These guys have nothing. And they're just looking up and talking. Where's this? Where Grush is all moving around and doing all these things. I know we may be talking about some kind of of uh, difference there when it when it comes to being on the spectrum. But still, look at that. I think he's tried to make an an alpha move. And like Greg was saying earlier, 
The alpha is not the one that comes in and starts, you know, hey, check me out. They're the ones that are quiet and everybody finally ends. They're the ones that end up being the leader because they're the ones that are in charge anyway when they come in. But look at this guy. He's not in charge. I don't feel like what he's saying, everything. He's he's being completely honest about it. But look at all that stuff in front of him. He's got stuff. It's wide, too. He's got things, all kinds of things laid out there. So look at that as we go through here. One thing I thought was interesting, though, was toward the end there when um, Fravor grabs his wrist in that weird way. He's grabbing it and he holds on to almost a, a double hold on himself. And I think he's containing excitement there. I think that's what that's about. I think he was so excited about that and has so much to say about it. But he's not, like Greg was going, was talking about earlier, he's not, or Mark was talking about earlier, He's not going with these big, huge stores. Man, you're not going to believe it, which I couldn't help but do that. But that's why I believe he's trying to control some of that, that excitement. That's why we're seeing that. Doesn't mean he's being dishonest. Doesn't mean he's being honest. But I think that's what it is. I think he's controlling his excitement at that point. So it's sort of an adapter. And in a way, it's he's regulating his, his own behavior by grabbing himself like that and, and holding on so that stuff doesn't leak out, so the excitement doesn't leak. All right. We good? Good. Uh -huh. No, Mark goes in first. You got that one. Oh, I forgot to. Yeah, I Let's didn't see. realize till Mark leaned in. I'm yeah, just yeah. the difference of the pro. You know, if you don't come to the match, Chase, you can't win the prize. That's you know. Well, I won so much that I didn't do the lean in this time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the laws of physics for a second. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Graves and, and Commander Favor, I heard you talk about speed. When uh, those objects broke uh, the sound barrier, did they make a sonic boom? I was in a jet. You can't hear anything. It's kind of loud in there. Yeah, you, you're not able to actually uh, personally tell within the vehicle. I will say the objects that we were seeing, they were spherical, uh, and they were observed up to Mach 2, uh, which is a very uh, non-aerodynamic shape. What about G-forces? Let's talk about G-forces of those vehicles. Could a human survive those G-forces with known technology today? No. No, not for the acceleration rates that we observed. Okay. What about what they look like? How close did you get? Did you see a seam or a rivet? or a section, and what I mean is, obviously, the jets you're flying have all those things. Did these objects have those? Do you want to go, Ryan? I didn't have, I didn't have the detail to be able to tell that. So we got within a half mile of Tic Tac, which people say that's pretty far, but it's, in airplanes, that's actually relatively close. No, it was perfectly white, smooth, no windows, although when we did take the original FLIR video that is out there, when you put it on a big screen, it actually had two little objects that came out of the bottom of it. Um, but other than that, no, no windows, no seams, no nothing. Satellite imagery. Let's talk about satellite imagery. We have satellites all over the place, some that we're aware of and many that we're not aware of, right? We're taking pictures of everything at every point in second. Uh, Mr. Grush, are you aware, do you have direct knowledge, or have you talked to people with direct knowledge that there are satellite imagery of these events? Uh, that was one of my primary tasks at NGA, since we uh, process, exploit, and disseminate that kind of information. I've seen multiple cases, some of which, to my understanding, and of course I left NGA in April, so that's my information cutoff date. Uh, but I personally um, reviewed both uh, what we call overhead collection and from other strategic and tactical platforms that were, I could not even explain prosaically. And I have a degree in physics, by the way, as well. And I had, uh, I, I'm aware that you guys have not seen these um, reports, unfortunately, and I don't know why. It is, do you have direct knowledge, or you had spoken people with direct knowledge that this imagery applies to crash sites, crash, crash imagery? I can't discuss that in an open session. Okay. Uh, do you have any information that the U.S. government is involved in a disinformation campaign to deny the existence of certain UAPs? I can't go beyond what I've already stated publicly in my News Nation interview because uh, it touches other sensitivities. Okay. All right, Chase, what do you got? I'm going to give you a question you can take home and ask yourself this question regularly in your everyday life. Is someone shaping how I perceive something? Is my perception being shaped by these, this person's words? And here's what you're uh, hearing from Mr. Grouch. Is that right? Grush? Grush. 
Fresh. If you go back and listen to this clip, I worked at high levels at the NGA. I had a lot of access. I have a huge vocabulary. I have a degree in physics. I saw reports that you did not. And he, in my opinion, he's more worried about the disinformation campaign or whatever it is. Question than anyone that we've seen so far when they talk about this campaign. And the question should not cause so much fear, uh, which you can see on his face at the final frame of this clip right here. And I think something is off about every aspect of this demeanor. And initially, I thought maybe he's just having to hold his tongue. And that's causing these behaviors because of the what they told him he can't say. But I was watching... Uh, what is causing this dramatization? What's causing the inflammation of the stories, the self-promotion and the unusual stuff that we're seeing here that has every hallmark that I would look for in a person who's acting? I'm at a loss for right now, but I can tell you uh, I'm not at the end of this. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things for me. I, I'm seeing the same thing you're seeing in that there's a lot of jargon and no content. Now, look, a lot of intelligence guys will overdo that. It's classified. If I told you I'd have to kill you, you know, that BS we all have heard. Look, anybody who knows real classified information simply doesn't talk about it. That's how it works. You don't say, hey, I know this. You don't deny it. You simply walk away. Next video is really interesting for that point. I'll talk about something he does there. But here is Interestingly, his body language and his mouth are saying the same thing. You know what they are? Nothing. It's a lot of words with no content. And again, he's not a musician. He's a manager. This guy knows nothing. He can't play anything. He can talk about the people who do. And he's talking about everything he's seen with long, rambling caveats and qualifiers before he ever answers. Now, if he's telling the truth, what a shame he's wasting all that energy because that's a lot of energy to tell the truth. And... He doesn't answer questions. He qualifies himself, and then he gives you his date of information. That's all intelligence speak. Qualifies him makes me know he is an intel guy, and he comes from that background. But I want to believe him, but I would crawl all over him right here because he's given me the tools for PE, for pride to go up and down, because people who are insecure fall for those. You beat them up, and then you flatter them. You know, It's kind of like an abusive relationship. You beat them up, and you flatter them, and you keep alternating that, and they start bleeding information. And he's bleeding that all, everywhere. Now, is he telling the truth? We don't know because he's not saying anything. He's not giving us anything that has content. Anyway, it, there was some good regulator use again in here when they're, when they're asking questions. But uh, actually, there's in here one time. Uh, where he uses a regulator to resist questioning. And the guy's asking questions. If he would let him keep going, he probably would have answered. Um, I don't know. When, when you ask a person a question and they've got the answer, they usually will answer it the first time if they're being honest. If they put you off and go to the second time, it's usually a delaying technique. So maybe he knows something, but we don't hear any of it here. We hear more intel speak, more jargon, and no content. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Look, satellite images are bored up. There's a vocal click from him. Hope that you appreciate that one, uh, Chase. Uh, I'll mention it just once there, but we've heard them throughout. I don't think it's a baseline for him, but I, I, I like what you said there, Chase, that it's maybe a baseline for that persona or that attitude that he's that he's being forced into or he's taking uh, right now. Um he starts with a with a resume statement. He starts with his resume. You know, here's how important, how big I am. He uses the word some, my understanding personally. So it's now become become, you know, personal beliefs about some things that he's then surrounded with his resume of importance. And he says, I could not even explain in words well he didn't say in words he used the word uses the word prosaically uh which <laughs> which means in words or, or more importantly that it could only be explained in some kind of art form maybe he thinks he could do some interpretive dance about it or write a piece of poetry or maybe do an entertainment show about it maybe on the history channel with his two friends in the background who he met at a star trek convention maybe there's a show coming up. It'd be nice. I think he'd be good in a show. I think it'd be fantastic. Uh, he says he can't openly discuss anything definite. I mean, again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the spirit 
of what he's saying there. He can't openly discuss anything definite. Well, that's unfortunate as a whistleblower. And I know everybody will have all kinds of reasons, why, but, but he can't. He can't say can't say stuff. Well, then, as Greg says, then don't say it. People who are under certain notices, they just don't say anything, in my experience. Um, you're right, Chase. Again, there's this worry about disinformation. And, and that's... That's interesting. Um, he talks. He says, "I can't. St- uh, I can't state anything further than I did in uh, the the News Nation, the TV interview." No, what you could do is say it all again under oath in front of the public, because there is a massive difference between saying something on in a news interview and saying it under oath. The same thing under oath to the American people and the world watching. There is a huge difference because, uh, you know, in the first instance, you can say, oh, you know, I just misspoke on that one or as a bit, you know, the, the lights and the, and I was, you know, I, I just emphasized stuff a bit more mis, misspoke. In the second one, you're lying to Congress and that's, and you know, that's important. But he, so he, he won't say under oath what he said in the News Nation. Uh, interview. And when he talks about the News Nation interview, there is uh, a Wallace and Gromit look of fear on him there, and then a look for approval on that. Did he say something in that News Nation uh, interview that was a little bit too big, a little bit effusive, a little bit too entertaining? Uh, I don't don't know, but certainly I see that Wallace and Gromit fear and, and that look for approval. Scott, what do you got? All right, Grush is doing that alluding and inflating thing again. And then at the end of it, he does the, the stress mouth or the or the compressed lips like he can't say anything. He's watching his mouth like uh, this is feeling more and more like an act the the longer it goes. It just it not it doesn't feel squirrely anymore. It just feels wrong, feels off. Maybe it's that comparison of of the two guys sitting next to him and him sitting there in the middle that's making it him stick out like that so so big, but Really starting to bug me, um, and when he talks about, um, of course, I left the in, uh, left NGA in April. He uses a huge regulator there. I mean, that's a big. It's like an, almost a hands off thing he, he's doing at that at, at that part at that point. Um, but his his illustrators have pretty much start disappearing at that point. Um, and then he's alluding to this plethora of sen- of sensitivities that he can't talk about. More alluding and, and inflating. And then when he talks about. Um, Prosaic, prosaically, he makes it sound like something that's really deep and heavy. And actually, <clears throat> prosaic means boring, you know, almost like mundane of the world. It's like if I said, oh, it, but I can make it sound cool. Like say, you know, here comes Mark with those prosaic stories about Greece. And he was just there. Mark, tell us, you know, but I'm actually, it's a smack in the face. I'm saying, tell us about one of those boring stories you talk about, Mark. So he's kind of, I think, you know, showing off a little bit there. I agree with you, Mark, on that. Um, now, one thing that that bugged me about this: <clears throat> there's a guy behind the guy who's asking the questions. It's on his right. Look at this guy. He's uh, he's goofing around. He's 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 not he's not paying attention. He's telling jokes or something or making fun of somebody um, with the person sitting next to him. I know what that looks like. It takes one to know one. So keep an eye on that guy if you get a chance. He's not paying attention at all. I think he probably got in trouble after this if they watched it and paid attention. Because we're talking about some very serious things. And this guy's supposed to be, what do they call those? Are they pages, interns? What are they? Are handlers. Them? That's what I call them. Handlers. Handlers. Well, this guy <laughs> is too young to be handling anything no, no, important, kidding. I think. And if he had anything he was going to do important, he won't be doing it anymore because he's goofing off with this woman sitting next to him. So that I think they're of, called aides, congressional aides. Aid. Oh, okay, he, he right. could be in charge based on what we have in there now. So <laughs> I bet he won't be aiding anymore after this when this guy sees this because this guy's completely doing a whole other thing. You know, he's bored. He's bored or something, making fun of of somebody. But watch him; he's making fun of somebody because I know that look. I try to get people to do that myself. So keep an eye on that guy. <laughs> Satellite imagery. Let's talk about satellite imagery. We have satellites all over the place, some that we're aware of and many that we're not aware of, right? We're taking pictures of everything at every point in second. 
Uh, Mr. Grush, are you aware, do you have direct knowledge, or have you talked to people with direct knowledge, that there are satellite imagery of these events? Uh, that was one of my primary tasks at NGA, since we uh, process, exploit, and disseminate that kind of information. I've seen multiple cases, some of which, to my understanding, and of course I left NGA in April, so that's my information cutoff date. Uh, but I personally um, reviewed both uh, what we call overhead collection and from other strategic and tactical platforms that were, I could not even explain prosaically. And I have a degree in physics, by the way, as well. And I had, uh, I, I'm aware that you guys have not seen these um, reports, unfortunately, and I don't know why. Is, do you have direct knowledge, or you had spoken people with direct knowledge, that this imagery applies to crash sites, crash, crash imagery? I can't discuss that in an open session. Okay. Uh, do you have any information that the U.S. government is involved in a disinformation campaign to deny the existence of certain UAPs? I can't go beyond what I've already stated publicly in my News Nation interview because uh, it touches other sensitivities. Okay. And, and so I want to get down to, if we can, some specifics, right? So um, at one point you said that there, 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 there uh, has been harmful activity or aggressive activity. Mm -hmm. Has any of the activity um, been aggressive, been um, hostile in your reports? Uh, I know of multiple colleagues of mine that got physically injured, and uh, the activity. And I got to by by UAPs or by by people within the the federal government. Both. Okay, yeah. so yeah. there has been activity by by alien or non non human technology and or beings that has caused harm to humans. Uh, I can't get into the specifics in a, an open environment, but at least the activity that I personally witnessed, and I have to be very careful here, because uh, you don't, you know, they tell you never to acknowledge tradecraft, right? So what I personally witnessed, myself and my wife, was very disturbing. Okay. Um, one of my constituents actually sent this next question, and I figured I'd ask it since I had the same thought. You've said that the U.S. has intact space, spacecraft. You said that the government has alien bodies or alien species. Have you seen, have you, have you seen the spacecraft? I have to be careful to describe what I've seen uh, firsthand and not in this environment, but I, I could answer that question behind, behind closed doors. Yeah. And have you seen any of the bodies? That's something I've, I've not I witnessed myself. Okay. Greg, what do you got? There's a ton here. I'm going to cover one thing. And this is the first time there's anything that makes me say, okay, I want to talk to Grush. And this is incongruent behavior, but it has a real and discernible meaning. If you've never worked in the intelligence business, you may not even think of this. If I say, have you seen, and you say no under oath, and I find out you have, guess what? You could be prosecuted. So listen to what he says and pay attention to his body language and everything else around it. If you've never, if there's no classification against something, it doesn't matter. And there's never a classification on something you haven't seen. I could ask Chase a question. He could give me an answer, and he may be divulging classified information, but he's not violated anything if he didn't know it was classified, if he didn't know that that existed. You may ask Chase, hey, do they have UFOs on board this ship? And he goes, yeah, he's just joking. Well, if, if they do later and it turns out and he didn't know, he's not violated a security clearance. But if you say, I have seen this thing, you have violated it. When you So they ask him two questions. The first question, have you seen craft? And he is very careful to avoid saying no. Pay attention to that. He's very careful to avoid saying no. But when they ask him, have you seen any alien bodies? Nope. This makes me want to talk to him because now there's credibility in what he just said to me. It shows me he's dancing around a topic and clearly not dancing around another one. That makes me wonder, maybe there's something to what he's saying. The first time I've actually thought it. Now, each person in the world is going to deal with how to interpret dealing with classified themselves. We all get read on. We all get told what we're supposed to do. But every time you ask a question, you have to work around it. it, it look, if I'd seen, I, I'll just leave it at that. Just right there is a very complex answer to a fairly simple question. And if you've never dealt with intelligence, you've never dealt with classified information, you might feel okay with saying yes or no. 
But when you're in front of Congress, now you have a double-edged sword you have to navigate, and he navigates it very effectively. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I got it here. Uh, he he can say he's not seen bodies. He won't say that he hasn't seen intact spacecraft. Well, an intact spacecraft is is anything that's going to give or take, uh, you know, a hundred miles or or so. You know, give give or take, depending on which scientist you're going to say uh, you're going to go with as where to space. I mean, I've seen intact spacecraft. It's not defined as to whether they're they're off world or on world or run by you know uh biologics which could be sugar you know i mean that's <laughs> sugar if that's you know so you know so so you know why he has to steer around that question i agree greg it's very interesting that he starts to navigate that one very carefully same way that he says uh, there's has um has alien or non-human caused uh, harm to a human being well, when that question was less defined, he said he'd said he both, both. But when they get specific with it, when it's specific, um, he uh, what was a yes becomes a I can't say. So why does that change as well? The more, the better the questioning, the more he clams up. The worse the questioning, the more opportunity he has to put on a a show that you might see on the History Channel very, very soon. Um, but look, that last part around the intact spacecraft, all of that um, has a lack of illustration to it. Lots of vocal clicks in there. That lip compression that Chase has been talking about, it's, shall we say, it's tight-mouthed at that at that point. Well, un- undoubtedly, you know, he's in intelligence. Un- undoubtedly, he's seen... Um, craft that can go to space that or near near enough um that he can't talk about i would say uh, greg you got a thought yeah one other thing remember in video two he said when he was asked about craft he said i know about people who have first-hand experience and now he's avoiding a question so production again sorry Jim, back to you yeah. uh scott what do you got on this one i'll tell you what i've seen spacecraft I've seen intact spacecraft, and there's a fellow named Elon Musk. I've seen him landing. I've seen video of what I believe is real spaceship landing. This guy could be telling the truth at this point because we've all seen those. Everybody watched when those things started landing back down the ocean. We've all seen the parachutes of the when the Apollo mission came back. We've all seen those, like Mark was alluding to. We've all seen spacecraft, so he's really not lying there. But he's talking about the specifics of seeing this new stuff, this this outer space stuff. That I, I believe that's that's the road he's going down. And that first question is yes or no. You guys are right. He doesn't say yes or no. And it's a yes or no. Have you seen him? Yeah or no. Neither one of those. So and then he says, I have to be very careful because they tell you never to acknowledge trade craft. Then just answer the question. The yes, yes, or, you know, he's not doing anything. And then why, for God's sake, open that can of worms about his wife? Why say that? Me and my wife, so, you know, are you kidding me, dude? So, because that's when I want to say, hang on, everybody hang on to say, let me, hey, man, what about this? What do you mean you and your wife? Was she with you? Were you in the car? Were you in some secret place on a base? What's going on? She's there? not cleared. I wouldn't think so either. And because she hasn't come up in this before and he didn't mention it, he didn't say anything about it. So I don't know. Why why even bring her up? So maybe he's talking about something he's seen out in the wild, like driving down a little road or something. If anybody's seen UFOs outside of this, if you're not in a, an airplane or you know, a fighter or something, maybe that's what he's talking about. You know? Maybe maybe this guy's nuts. I don't know. I'm not gonna say he's nuts. I won't assume he's may, may be nuts. I'm just saying. Maybe that's the road he's going down there. My wife, why in the world would you bring her into this? That's, I don't know, That's that. Th- this seems like James Pyle's turf for me. There seems like a whole lot of questions that could be asked in here in a mellow way to get this guy to start talking. So um, I think it's just a, a, a lame attempt to hide information that he doesn't have to make it look like he has information. That that alluding and inflating, I think that's that's what's going on. Chase, what do you got? I have actually seen 
a alien spacecraft pull a human being off of the earth into the craft it's a movie called fire in the sky and uh i saw that craft so what he's thinking here i'm willing to bet that someone showed him a sketch or something of a craft and he might associate seeing a sketch of a craft with seeing a craft and uh he's deliberately not telling us the difference there i think that might be what's going on and this has every hallmark of what i would just call a campaign where some there's a very hard narrative being sold uh with this campaign with the vagueness and the dramatization there's dramatic flair and language there's what i think is acting and uh inauthentic expressions and there's exaggerated language and it's just kind of pointing in a direction to suggest something while saying nothing whatsoever and the backtracking and wordsmithing his way out of questions is just bizarre and um, he's contributed nothing of value no nothing of substance on the entire news interview he did and this entire congressional hearing they say i know of multiple colleagues of mine that got physically injured who doesn't know multiple people who have been physically injured because that's all he says he doesn't say it was by these things he just says i know lots of people who have been physically injured and i think he does that deliberately and i think he wants you to think that it's by these beings and i think it's not because we can all say those words and it be true under oath but the congressman sees this and calls him on it. And then he says both UAPs and people within the government have been have done this. So he says UAP instead of this entity. UAP means it's something up in the air, right? It's a phenomenon up in the air. But they're referring to the craft as UAP and so is he who should be the expert. And he didn't right here. So he admits it, like Mark said, and then backtracks and won't talk about anything. And when he's saying they tell you never to acknowledge tradecraft, there's something about that statement right there that feels a lot like I'm literally witnessing tradecraft on the screen being done on me. So he redirects to this vague nonsense reference to something he saw with his wife that has no detail whatsoever. Mr. Burleson, I think is his name, sees the the maybe what is bs and you can see that smile on his face when he does and then he asks have you seen the spacecraft it's a yes or no question i won't even get into dissecting this one just compare his answer to a yes or no question the answers of the other guys at this table and if this doesn't feel like bizarre misinformation to you i don't know what to tell you that's all i got and, and so I want to get down to, if we can, some specifics, right? So um, at one point you said that there, 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 there uh, has been harmful activity or aggressive activity. Mm -hmm. Has any of the activity um, been aggressive, been um, hostile in your reports? Uh, I know of multiple colleagues of mine that got physically injured. And uh, the activity... And I got to buy by UAPs or by by people within the the federal government. Both. Okay, okay. Yeah. so there has been activity by by alien or non non human technology and or beings that has caused harm to humans. Uh, I can't get into the specifics in a, an open environment, but at least the activity that I personally witnessed. And not to be very careful here, because uh, you don't, you know, they tell you never to acknowledge tradecraft, right? So what I personally witnessed, myself and my wife, was very disturbing. Okay. Um, one of my constituents actually sent this next question, and I figured I'd ask it since I had the same thought. You've said that the U.S. In has intact space spacecraft. You said that the government has alien bodies or alien species. Have you seen... Have you, have you seen the spacecraft? I have to be careful to describe what I've seen uh, firsthand and not in this environment, but I, I could answer that question behind, behind closed doors. Yeah. And have you seen any of the bodies? That's something I've, I've not, 
a witness myself. <laughs> Mr. Gresh, uh, a couple of questions for you too, sir, this morning. Um, what percentage of UAPs do you feel are adequately investigated by the U.S. government? Of the 5% that are reported. <laughs> um, I can only speak for uh, my personal leadership over at NGA. I tried to look at every report that came through that I mm -hmm. could triage. So. Do you believe that officials at the highest levels of our national security apparatus have unlawfully withheld information from Congress and subverted uh, our oversight authority? There are certain elected leaders that had more information that I'm not sure what they've shared with certain Gang of Eight members or et cetera, but uh, certainly uh, I would not be surprised. Okay. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and you may or may not be able to answer my last question, and maybe we get into a skiff at the next hearing that we have, but who in the government either, what agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. Super. Thank you. And I yield back. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, what have we got on this? Officials at the highest level of national security, uh, that would be people like uh, John Clapper behind him, uh, former director of uh, national intelligence, uh, have unlawfully withheld and subverted. And Clapper, watch his hands. There's, as Chase would call it, there's some digital flexion on his hands when that's, when that's talked about. So I don't know whether... Clapper thinks that he's being talked about uh, there, but it does the the, uh, the the mantle does seem somewhat to to fit him on that. Uh, then there's talk of a witness list, like uh, you know, yeah, I can, I, and he says, "Look, I'm happy to provide that to you after the the hearing." Um, so Corbell uh, in the background there, who who makes shows about uh, UFOs and strange phenomenon, he's like, yeah, 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 the, the, the list. That's that's uh, he's in full agreement with the list. McCulloch, who's his lawyer uh, behind, we see a beautifully kind of delicate action <laughs> on his finger on this. Now I don't know what the finger. Uh, there's two options on that finger. That's either the finger of like, yeah, I must get that list together uh in order to provide that or well, that's the raised finger of like yeah i don't think we'll be doing that actually i don't think there will be so let's see let's see whether there's a list or not uh if, if the, now why is corbell in agreement with that i think corbell would be on that list i think corbell would be top of that like i know a guy i met him at a at a star trek convention and and he's seen or he knows people who's seen all kinds in fact he's got a whole show about this this stuff with his mate who's just sitting next to your lawyer there they got a whole history channel thing going and done on a ranch uh, owned by a guy who well i mean investigate that for yourselves that's an interesting that's an interesting uh, money maker but uh yeah i love that little I love that little finger there. It's all I got on that one. Chase, what do you see here? Didn't I go already? No. Did you? No, not this time. Not this time. Number nine. Sorry. Sorry. You want to do that again? Yeah. Chase, what do you got on this one? Uh, when he's saying, I can only speak for my personal leadership, 
over at NGA, not in his experience. He says leadership, and he wants you to hear that word. And I'm just going to let that remark sit with you for a minute. And he's saying, I tried to look at every report that came through that I could triage. This has two qualifications just to remove all specificity. Nothing specific, empty, void, hollow, empty. His behavior is just avoidant and vague and deliberately misdirecting. And I think unable to even just say something that he thinks is true. And it was a simple question that didn't involve national security details, and he couldn't even answer that. This is why this has so many weird qualities of what I would call a campaign. And something is being sold here, and it's odd that the only or just one person at this table is kind of selling this vague idea, and two people are answering questions. There's only two people at this table answering questions. Do you know what document he couldn't? could produce, which he hasn't, is the list of what he can't talk about. There should be a list that should be public of what he can't talk about because he's comfortable saying what he can't talk about. And I like how Miss Mace really took him to the mat a little bit here. And after kind of massaging his words back to him so many times, she's finally got a direct answer. And I would bet that she didn't get a list after this. And if she did get a list, I bet it's a crappy one. That's all I'll say. Greg? Now, I think he's got a list. I think that list may be meaningless, but he's got a list of hostile and cooperative witnesses, people he's talked to. I think this is the crux of everything. I think, remember I said in the other one, I thought he had kind of an ax to grind somewhere. I think he's got a list of people who blocked him and people who helped him. And I think that's what he would give them. And people who fit his narrative, whatever his narrative is. I don't know what the guy knows. We, none of us can tell. The one thing that's interesting is, Chase, you talk about that rambling, rattling, empty language. I think it's his baseline. I just do. I think he is a guy who, you know, thinks words are a premium, prosaic. He th plugs in these words that we would all say, okay, yeah, I understand the word. I would never use it. That's just his pattern, I think. And I think if you if we agree with that, then we would say his baseline then when he goes to this specific hostile and cooperative is identical to that useless information he rambles in the first question when they ask him about whatever it was you know, about the when she asked him a question about being reviewed and he goes back to his own reference you're right he rambles and rambles and rambles and i think he's a non-specific speaker if that makes sense to you he gets his message across with a lot of words and doesn't really drive home a point then when he gets to this biologics thing it's more that well, what are biologics? Exactly what the hell are biologics? Is he talking to a core audience somewhere? He's trying to use their language. That's probably what it is. It's jargon. But otherwise, Mark, I agree with you. Sugar is a biologic. Termites are a biologic. Anything can be a biologic. Oh, you, are you having biologics for lunch? Yeah, biologics. <laughs> but he does a lot of lip compression we associate with withholding facts. He does a thumbs up. He does a verbal. I, I'm just going to leave it. The only thing that he is doing here is more the same. And I think it's just his baseline for rambling without delivering information and using jargon. Probably the best two points I've seen from him, though, are this one, because he says, I tried to review everything that I had the opportunity to. And then the last one where he's navigating that thing. The rest of it, it's all all jargon with no content, which I associate with disinformation because of my background. Scott, what do you got? All right. They're talking about non-human biologics. So think about Those are non-human biologics. He, no, he's not even what humans. I'm saying. Anything that's <laughs> not human is a non-human biologic. It could be a mouse. It could be a dog. It could be um, any, yeah, anything that is biologic that is not human. That's just, it's just, I don't know. This it stinks. This whole thing smells. And if you played that game, one of these things is not like the other. Remember the little kids game? Rush wouldn't fit in here. He's the one that doesn't fit. I don't think these guys on the outside would even hang out with this cat, man. I think he would get on their nerves so fast. I I, I think I think they say, no, no, dude, don't let him in. Who is it? You know, the knock on the door. Who is it? It's Grush. I still there. I don't think they let him in. I think they'd be so over it and over him. And I, <laughs> I wail on this gal. Stop doing that. Um, <laughs> he's adapting in almost every way you possibly can. 
He's using his head. He's using his eyebrows. He's using his chin. He's using his hands. He's using his arms, his torso. Everything is ad- is adapting here. Everything is illustrating here. He's he's kind of going off on this section here. I don't think he's coming apart or anything, but I think he's I think he's saying the same thing over and over so many times. It's starting to even bother him. There's some. There's only so many ways you can you can pretend you know something that you don't. And I think that's what we're we're seeing him experience this uh, right now. And, he, and when he talks about a skiff, I'll look this up. That's a sensitive compartmented compartmented information facility. In other words, it's like the cone of silence comes out. It's, apparently, it's, it's usually really, like you know, the size of a closet. Yeah, yeah it depends. Just, I've worked. I've worked. Look, we've had buildings that giant buildings that are skiffs. It depends on where you're at. It's a contained area. And just give you an example. In my past life, we'd have collateral on this side skiff on that side when you walk in the door if you're cleared your badge lets you in this side if you're not cleared your badge might let you into a sally port but you didn't get out of there and the, What's if a sally a port? person a sally port's two doors that lock and oh. so you get in you don't get out and so it, it's a control mechanism but if you were uncleared in a building like this for example you have a guy coming in to work on the air conditioning boop, we flip a switch lights go red everybody puts their stuff away it's it's contained. And then to Chase's point, even within that area, there will be other areas that are even more confined and more protected. So there's access once you get in there. And so, yeah, it's it's a it's a building. It's a contained area and they have them, I'm sure, in Congress. But anyway, yeah, on, on boats, they're all over the place. And you have okay, them in business so- as well. So some people will work in some businesses where you have. That's right. That's right. Exactly the yep. same. Okay. So anyway, like I was saying, <laughs> it's like a <laughs> sorry, it's my silence. <laughs> no, I totally get it, dude. I don't. I had to look it up. I don't know what skiff is. Yep. How am I yep. going to know? You know. Anyway, um, all right. Well, you guys covered it all. So <laughs> thank you. Good to go there. <laughs> Mr. Gresh, uh, a couple of questions for you too, sir, this morning. Um, what percentage of UAPs do you feel are adequately investigated by the U.S. government? Of the 5% that are reported. <laughs> um, I can only speak for uh, my personal leadership over at NGA. I tried to look at every report that came through that I could mm-hmm. triage. So, Do you believe that officials at the highest levels of our national security apparatus have unlawfully withheld information from Congress and subverted uh, our oversight authority? There are certain elected leaders that had more information that I'm not sure what they've shared with certain Gang of Eight members or et cetera, but uh, certainly uh, I would not be surprised. Okay. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and you may or may not be able to answer my last question, and maybe we get into a skiff at the next hearing that we have, but who in the government either... What agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. Super. Thank you. And I yield back. Oh, is it true that you saw, in your words, a 40 foot flying tic tac shaped object? That's correct. Or for some people that can't know what a tic tac is, it's a giant flying propane tank. 
Fair enough. Did this object come up on radar or interfere with your radar or, or the USS Princeton? The Princeton tracked it, the Nimitz tracked it, the E-2 tracked it. We never saw it on our radars. Our fire control radars never picked it up. The other airplane that took the video did get it on a radar. As soon as it tried to lock it, it jammed the radar, spit the lock, and he, he's rapidly switched over to the targeting pod, which he can do in the, uh, in the F-18. From what you saw that day and what you've seen on video, did you see any source of propulsion from the flying object, including on any potential th thermal scans from your aircraft? No, there's none. There's no uh, IR plume coming out. Uh, and Chad, who took the video, went through all the EO, which is black and white TV, and the IR modes, and there's no visible signs of propulsion. It's just sitting in space at 20,000 feet. In, in your career, have you ever seen a propulsion system that creates no thermal exhaust? No. Can you describe how the aircraft maneuvered? Uh, abruptly, uh, very determinant. It knew exactly what it was doing. It was aware of our presence. And it had acceleration rates. I mean, it went from zero to matching our speed in no time at all. Now, if the fastest plane on Earth was trying to do these maneuvers that you saw, would it be capable of doing that? No, not even close. And just to confirm, this object had no wings, correct? No wings. Now, was the aircraft that you were flying, was it armed? No, it never felt threatened at all. If, if the aircraft was armed, do you believe that your aircraft or any aircraft in possession of the United States could have shot the Tic Tac down? I'd say no. Just on the performance, it would have just left in a, in a split second. It looks like that we have a problem here that needs further investigation. <laughs> yes. Uh, in your belief, is this... This flying Tic Tac, I mean, is, this, is it capable of being the product of any other nation on the Earth? No, I actually said, like I said earlier, I think it defies current material science and the ability to develop that much propulsion. And I, I know there's been some physicists have done calculations, which is beyond anything that we have. Well, either the United States has an adversary here in this world that we don't know, or we really have some serious investigations to do. I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, is there anything else about the November 14th, 2004 incident that you think is important for this committee to know that you haven't been asked here today? No, I, I, you know, it's, it's been said it's probably the most credible UFO sighting in history based on all the sensors that were tracking it, and then for us to get visual and to go against the naysayers, it, it's something on the screen or whatever. I mean, there's four sets of human eyeballs. We're all very credible. Of the six of us that were involved in the thing, including the video, every one of us is going to do 20-plus years in the military in very responsible positions. So I'd say the world needs to know that. that this, it's not a joke. Oh, thank you. All right, Chase, what do you got? Let me just give you a little background on EO, IR, what all this means from a military perspective. I used EO and IR for decades. So EO is electro-optical and IR is infrared, which means thermal. And even with all the like the bazillion dollar technology that goes into those things, there's still like a weird black and white camera. I don't know. They need to team up with GoPro or something like that and maybe <laughs> together. Uh, and this is using this thing called a FLIR, which stands for forward-looking infrared. And to use this FLIR on most aircraft that I've seen and on the boat uh, that I was a captain of, you have to hold this little remote in your hand, and we call it the potato. And it's got a giant grip, and you have to kind of lock onto these targets and work this camera. And the way that they capture these Tic Tacs is masterful. Like the person working that potato, which sounds ridiculous, did a really good job. So we use the potato to capture the Tic Tac. So we've got that going for us. Everything in the video here lines up. You might have seen stress. So keep in mind, social pressure and public speaking stress looks a lot different than deception stress. And so deception stress occurs at these specific points and spikes when somebody's speaking or listening, typically in response to the mention of a topic uh, of something that's stressing them out. 
Or when somebody experiences social stress, it occurs throughout their speaking and doesn't really spike in these specific moments of dialogue. So even if you saw a spike or two, what we would also be looking for are the linguistic signals and indicators for deception. We have this list of 30-something signals that we look for when we're analyzing. And we look for deceptive behaviors. And I don't mean just lying. I don't mean just lying. This includes deception. Uh, or deceptive intent, like misdirection, disinformation, avoidance, concealment, and suppression. Those are all kind of what we're really looking for. So when we say there's some deception here, it doesn't always mean someone's directly lying. It could be one of those other things there. Scott, what do you think? All right. this He is so excited to be talking about this, he can hardly stand it. One time, uh, my brother's son, my nephew, Strummer, that's his name, Strummer, he got something for Christmas, and he was so excited about it, he could hardly stand it. And that's what he looked and sounded like when he was explaining it to my dad. When he ran and took it to him and said, oh, you're, or before he got to see, he said, you're not going to believe this. Here's what I, here's what happened. And he, he could hardly stand it. He was so excited. That's what Fravor looks like. He's so excited about this, he can't hardly stand it. You don't see that kind of excitement when somebody's being deceptive. I think this guy's full on telling exactly what he saw, and he's excited about it. Um he, he, he literally lights up as he's talking about this. Um, now, for the second question, he illustrates by counting on his, on his fingers and that stuff. He's, he's going like we talked about earlier, right down the road of everything looking the way it should look when you're being honest. His illustrators are on point. When he talks, they hit the words hit on the illustrator. Nothing showing, no little weird movements, no um, uh, fading facts, nothing like that. He's not... We're not seeing a lot of the classics we use. If you're playing bingo during this, or if you're playing the behavior panel bingo, you're not going to have squat on here because we're not seeing anything that shows deception. So come back next week. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have more deception to show you. But this guy is being, I, I think he's being completely honest. Um, now, th on the third question, uh, he uses his thumbs. And I think that's to help quell his excitement when he's run, rubbing them together. He's got to get rid of – that's an adapter. He's trying to get rid of some of that built-up stress and, and tension. But in this case, it's not stress and tension. It's just excitement from what's going on because he's trying to stay cool about what he's seeing. Because um, he, we're hearing a first-hand account of what happened. And he knows it. And there's nobody else that's out talking about this. And he's getting to tell everybody about it. He was on Joe Rogan. And so he got to tell a whole lot of people about it probably more than watch this, but now he's in, in front sure. of Congress and doing those things. So he's really excited about that, which is, I, you know, I can understand that. that that's awesome. Um, and, and Grush, this, or, or Fravor, this is the first time we, this is the most animated he's been. He's, he's making all the moves. He's doing everything we see with someone who's excited about something they really saw or really ex experienced. Like when they rode a, a roller coaster that was really exciting or something almost happened, but they got away with it. They, we see it. That's the excitement you see. They're, they're all, you won't believe what happened. That's the vibe he's given off. So I, I'm totally in with this guy. I totally believe. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, these these two guys on the outside of this uh, jamboree that's, that's going on, they brand themselves as credible and they deliver as credible uh, – every time so you know a lot of credibility on the outside of of this um yeah exciting story uh longworthy i think his name is who's questioning on this i would call him confounded by this story uh you know he's stumped uh, he doesn't know what to do i think with with this information coming which is very credible well told accurate information what does he do with that he says we have a problem here that needs further investigation this has piqued his curiosity there's a mystery he's engaged he says it needs serious investigation and from my understanding serious investigation always requires budget always requires money and I know somebody who's taken money for serious investigations before, and they happen to own Skin Skin Changer Ranch or whatever the place is. Skin Walker, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, I think if there's money going, I, I know somebody who's taken twenty two million on one of those before, and maybe they'll do it again. I don't know. I'm you know, I'm just I'm just me sitting here, but call it as I see it. Um, Greg, what do you got on this one? 
Yeah, for $22 million, I'll find a UFO on my ranch. You guys just bring it. Bring it. I'll find I'll something. That, I promise UFO. you. For $22 million, I'll build it and drive it to your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we probably know somebody who's got the technology. Hey, a couple of things. As we walk through this, you've all said it, but let's talk about congruency. It's really hard to fake something and to get the timing of amusement and humor and everything else right. Pay attention to that because there's consistency and his congru- he's congruent and his illustrators, his hands are moving, his tone, his word choice, they all work together. He's amused. Look at his upper face is smiling, even when his lower face isn't. That's amusement. That's a good thing, a good indicator. He's counting down, illustrating exactly what he's thinking. And his, his words are hitting, his tone's hitting, his cadence is hitting as he touches those fingers. Not out of line, not chased. Or Scott, you always talk about illustrators that are out of sequence. His forehead is up, request for approval, but that's his baseline. If you watch him on everything he does, when he's talking about how long he was in the Navy, he still does that. And then when he goes to listing the tech, he does the same exact thing. His bums come up in confidence. He's got a playful yes in response to we have a problem. And, you know, How do you do that? You have to be in the moment, not thinking about what you need to say next. Makes it much better. Then you get a great what else question. Thumbs come up. He starts to illustrate. And then after he says it's no joke, his lips compress in withheld information. Now, that can be emotion. That can be how he feels about the whole thing and all that. It's it's really interesting to me to watch the difference. Guys, if you want to see a fundamental difference in what we're talking about, this is it. This is look backward. Look at a real, true story. Look at a person who is telling you a lot without telling you anything. This guy has very few details because that's what he saw. The other guy's got a ton of words and no details. So short and to the point. Oh, is it true that you saw in your words a 40 foot flying TikTok shaped object? That's correct. Or for some people that can't know what a Tic Tac is, it's a giant flying propane tank. Fair enough. Did this object come up on radar or interfere with your radar or, or the USS Princeton? The Princeton tracked it, the Nimitz tracked it, the E-2 tracked it. We never saw it on our radars. Our fire control radars never picked it up. The other airplane that took the video did get it on a radar. As soon as it tried to lock it, it jammed the radar, spit the lock, and he, he rapidly switched over to the targeting pod, which you can do in the, uh, in the F-18. From what you saw that day and what you've seen on video, did you see any source of propulsion from the flying object, including on any potential th- thermal scans from your aircraft? No, there's none. There's no uh, IR plume coming out. uh, And Chad, who took the video, went through all the EO, which is black and white TV, and the IR modes, and there's no visible signs of propulsion. It's just sitting in space at 20,000 feet. In in your career, have you ever seen a propulsion system that creates no thermal exhaust? No. Can you describe how the aircraft maneuvered? Uh, Abruptly, uh, very determinate. It knew exactly what it was doing. It was aware of our presence. And it had acceleration rates. I mean, it went from zero to matching our speed in no time at all. Now, if the fastest plane on Earth was trying to do these maneuvers that you saw, would it be capable of doing that? No, not even close. And just to confirm, this object had no wings, correct? No wings. Now, was the aircraft that you were flying, was it armed? No, never felt threatened at all. If, if the aircraft was armed, do you believe that your aircraft or any aircraft in possession of the United States could have shot the Tic Tac down? I'd say no. Just on the performance, it would just left in a, in a split second. It looks like that we have a problem here that needs further investigation. <laughs> yes. Uh, in your belief, is this... This flying Tic Tac, I mean, is, this, is it capable of being the product of any other nation on the Earth? No, I actually I said, like I said earlier, I think it defies current material science and the ability to develop that much propulsion. And I, I know there's been some physicists of them calculations, which is beyond anything that we have. Well, either the United States has an adversary here in this world that we don't know, or we really have some serious investigations to do. I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, is there anything else about the November 14th, 2004 incident that you think is important for this committee to know that you haven't been asked here today? No, I, I, you know, it's, it's been said it's probably the most credible UFO sighting in history based on all the sensors that were tracking it, and then for us to get visual 
And to go against the naysayers, it, it's something on the screen or whatever. I mean, there's four sets of human eyeballs. We're all very credible. Of the six of us that were involved in the thing, including the video, every one of us is going to do 20 plus years in the military in very responsible positions. So I'd say the world needs to know that. that this, it's not a joke. Oh, thank you. All right, Mark, what do you think we've seen up to this point? How's it looking to you? Yeah, I mean, such credible witnesses on the outside of this, on the inside of this, you know, there seems to be a, a you know, a lot of narrative around this individual on the inside about, uh, you know, a, a brave patriot, um, you know, delivering us the truth. I just wonder because of the arena that this is in, this situation that we're seeing, the context that we're seeing, all this uh, behavior, um, uh you know who is for this idea of of patriots and the truth who's backing the politicians that are around those kind of ideals we've got some interesting um uh scenery around grouch of clapper knapp mcculloch corbell i mean specifically knapp and corbell the only piece of person we haven't got there is robert bigelow at the moment and and you know maybe he'll show up at at some at at some point, but it seems to me, as Chase, you've been saying, there is a show going on here. Um, definitely the delivery of a of an idea, and potentially an actual show we'll see on TV at at some point with some with some um, backing, all kinds of political backing uh, behind it as we come towards election time. Uh, Chase, what do you got on that? I think this was perfect. Uh, it's like y'all were saying, it helps us to very clearly show the stark contrast between the two types of people here at this table. And we have one who is uh, theatrical, sensational, dramatic, and I think more focused on himself than the information. And the others were focused on communication, helping the country, ensuring that Congress is informed rather than entertained. And I think that was a stark contrast uh greg what do you got yeah people ask me every time when we do these shows you don't believe there's anything out there you think that you know everything and i said no absolutely not I, we wouldn't do these shows if i thought that i would say i'm not covering that bs something is happening two credible people who've seen something i haven't seen are giving us real details and people of science with clear heads who are military folks that i trust they're telling us something they saw. And then in the middle, you got this other guy. So just because I don't believe Bob Lazar has been an aircraft mechanic for aliens, and I don't believe this guy is being forthcoming and being honest and telling facts, that doesn't mean I don't believe there's something. I know somebody who's seen something, not given to fancy, who gave me real details. I may ask her to come on here and tell us her story. But that doesn't mean that this is not disinformation. When something, if tomorrow... I were trying to make the American public respond to the fact there are UFOs positively, I would overstate, overstate the danger so that when we did come out and show something, it would seem less dangerous. That is 101, how you affect people's personality. If you make something seem a lot worse than it is, then when it actually occurs, it feels a lot less powerful. Part of the Sears School thing is it's intense. So that when you get there, you were prepared and you understand. So you're inoculating the person's brain against that ultimate uncovering of data. That's how disinformation could work. One example. I'm not saying it is, just saying that's possible. Scott, what do you think? I agree with all you guys. I think this is the perfect example of seeing two people who are being completely honest up against somebody who is, you know, not being completely honest or is making things or is, yeah. I, I don't think we're seeing the truth coming out of this guy, Grush. That's me. That's the way it looks to me. I think we're seeing honesty and then a lot of deception from Grush and a lot of of dodging. Like I was saying earlier, you know, he's alluding and 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 making th and and making things bigger than they are that he can't talk about. I just it just seems I, I don't know so strange to. to not have seen this and thought it out beforehand before they said, okay, pull the trigger on that. Let's put those three up and put him in the middle. I don't know if he ended up in the middle on purpose or what. And if someone, I'm like, Greg, if somebody asked me after watching this, they say, well, what do you think about that? The, the congressional hearing with the UAP thing. I say, well, I believe these guys on the outside here saw something 
they've never seen before. And I believe everything they said. And they never once said, I saw you, uh, an alien. They never even brought up aliens. That's all this guy in the middle is talking about. Grush, he's, 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 he's filtering everything toward there being aliens there. Not that I don't believe that there are. There have to be. There has to be something out there. We can't be the only ones. That's my take on it anyway. That's my view of it. Just because I'm saying I think this guy's not being completely honest. And the same thing with with the guy, uh, what's it, Lazar, we were talking about earlier. It doesn't mean I don't believe there are things out there or any of us believe that. It's just I don't believe them when they're telling, when they're talking about it. That's my take on it. Anyway, from, yeah. from my point of view. So. All right, fellas, thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?